Just do a quick overview. First of all, we've got Bob DeMott. Bob is the Edwin and Ruth Kennedy Distinguished Professor Emerita of English Emerita at The Ohio University in the early 1980s. Huh? In the early 1980s, Bob was also the director of the Steinbeck Research Center at San Jose State. He's the author of the seminal Steinbeck's typewriter, Essays on His Art, and he also edited Working Days, The Journals of Grapes of Wrath, as well as the Steinbeck titles for the Library of America, Steinbeck's journals and nonfiction, as well as Grapes of Wrath. Uh, Bob has a forthcoming book that we're all very excited for from University of New Mexico Press. It's scheduled for an October release this year, and it's called Steinbeck's Imaginarium, Essays on Writing, Fishing, and Other Critical Matters. Next up, we've got Susan Schillinglaw. Susan is a professor of English Emerita at San Jose State University, where she taught for 37 years. For 18 of those years, uh, Dr. Schillinglaw was director of the University's Center for Steinbeck Studies. She's published wild, widely um, and a little wildly on Steinbeck, uh, including A Journey into Steinbeck's California, which is in its third printing, Carol and John Steinbeck, A Portrait of a Marriage, which I highly recommend, and On Reading the Grapes of Wrath from Penguin in 2014. Susan also wrote introductions to several Steinbeck books for the Penguin New American Library. Our third speaker today is Keenan Norris. Keenan is a novelist, and his latest novel is The Confession of Copeland Kane. Uh, his forthcoming book is Chai Boy, Native Sons and Chicago Reckonings, which will be published in November. Keenan's essay, One Coyote, won the 2021 Folio Eddie Award for Best Overall and Special Interest Article, and it was also a finalist for a National Arts and Entertainment Journalism Award. Keenan was the 2021 University of Virginia Rea Visiting Writer, and is also a guest editor with the Oxford, Amer Oxford African American Studies Center. Keenan also serves as the coordinator of the Steinbeck Fellows Program and teaches at San Jose State University. And for myself, I'm Daniel Lanza Rivers. My pronouns are they and them. And I'm assistant professor of American Studies and Literature at San Jose State, where I also direct the Martha Heasley Cox Center for Steinbeck Studies. Um, my teaching at SJSU includes environmental humanities, US literature, cultural studies, and animal studies. And my research explores the way that settler ideas about California's natural state have shaped um, the region's environments, economies, and social politics since colonization. Uh, and just a little plug, you can check out my article, which is forthcoming in the Steinbeck Review, titled, The Land Doesn't Stretch, Fecundity, Agriculture, and Settler Visions of California into a God Unknown. Uh, and I've also got a little piece of creative nonfiction coming out in terrain.org in April. So welcome everyone. Happy early birthday, Steinbeck. Um, so we're gonna try to do a sort of conversational format. Um, I've got some prep questions, but rather than just going kind of point by point down the list, we'll also have some dialogue with each other, maybe some follow-up questions. We've set aside time at the end for audience questions. So if you've got questions for our esteemed presenters, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. Um, yeah, and to start with, I was thinking we could just kind of uh, begin with, well, we're gonna start with some general questions. I've got a few targeted questions we'll probably get to at the end. But to start with, I'd love to hear from our presenters, you know, um, on the occasion of Steinbeck's 120th birthday, why read Steinbeck or why read Steinbeck now? Why is the author and his works particularly relevant to our current moment? And I can ask someone to start or feel free to jump in if you feel like you've got it. Yeah, I think he's, uh, I think he's still relevant. Uh, you know, it depends on, depends on what lens you look at, look at him through, but in most cases, uh, you know, if you're a writer, if you're concerned with social justice, if you're interested in issues of the environment, Steinbeck speaks to those, and he speaks to them in ways that even his, you know, great vaunted Nobel Prize winning peers didn't do necessarily, Hemingway and, and Faulkner. Um, and I think they, uh, you know, the pendulum is swinging a lot. I mean, there was a time when, you know, the, the whole deal was uh, who reads a Steinbeck book except people in high school. That's changed quite a bit now. I think that we come back to the realization that here's a guy who wrote one of the great 
the greatest novels of in American literary history, The Grapes of Wrath. Um, and you know, you just simply can't deny that, deny its presence, deny its relevance, deny its ongoing um, vitality. You know, those, that's a hard combination to beat. So yeah, I, I, still, I still think he's, he's relevant. So are many others, but Steinbeck's right up there, I think, in a lot of ways. You know, I'm editing right now um, a book of essays on Travels with Charlie. So my mind is turning to Travels with Charlie frequently. But, you know, uh, the subtitle initially was In Quest of America, and he called it Operation Windmill, and the truck was Rosinante. So he was going on a kind of quixotic journey across America to try to figure out what you know America means. And he really was wrestling with the whole notion of what does it mean to be an American or, and I think, you know, what are we doing today? We're trying to figure out who we are and what we are. Um, he says, he said at one point in the book, if there is indeed an American image built of truth, rather, rather than reflecting either hostility or wishful thinking, what is that image? <laughs> and I guess that question is, resonates today, built on truth rather than wishful thinking. What is it? Who are we? And he tackled that in those books of the 30s, which is really kind of a Jeremiah warning us to, you know, take heed. And I think we're in a similar, really, you know, era of conflict and uh, uncertainty. And Steinbeck was willing to confront that, not always with answers, not, not admitting he didn't necessarily have answers, but certainly looking at the problems. Yeah, um, I'd like to, you know, sort of piggyback off of what both uh, Bob and Susan have said in in, um, no, in, in emphasizing Steinbeck's uh, you, tremendous relevance to the current moment, especially given the issues of income inequality, um, gentrification, particularly in our cities, particularly in you know, Steinbeck's native California, um, income inequality, the uh, other kinds of politic, socio-political issues um, that, that sort of metastasize from that basic, um, from that basic uh, um, disparity, right? In terms of um, material well-being, um, he's tremendously, relevant I, I see I see his work as tremendously relevant uh, both for those high school kids who hopefully are still reading his work and uh, for those of us uh, who are a few years past high school so. awesome thanks yeah I was just chatting a couple notes I think to me too one of the things that stands out is um, and I just read um, in dubious battle recently. So maybe that's sort of what's on my mind. But I mean, I think the, the conversation about unions is as relevant as it's ever been in this country, right? And also the so, sort of promises and dangers of collective action, right? Because he's so much, especially in that book, but not just only, but so much about, you know, the fa failings, right? Like the, the sort of nature of collective groups or populism, um, both for good and, and as a danger. I don't know, that's something that's been sticking with me. Um, all right, yeah, so another one, and this one's a little bit more of candy, but we are at a birthday party, right? Um, if you had to pick a contemporary author who seems to you like an inheritor of Steinbeck's work, who would it be? And is there a book, an essay, a story of theirs that really captures Steinbeck's spirit for you and kind of how does that piece do it? So it's a multi-part question, who's your sort of inheritor? Is there a piece that really kind of captures that? And then the why, you know, why, why does that piece resonate with the sort of Steinbeckian spirit? You know, if it were, if for me, it's somebody who died recently uh, and he was a dear friend of mine, and that's Jim Harrison, uh, who uh, I spent, we had 20 years of, of good friendship and we used to speak about Steinbeck all the time. And uh, he started by, uh, his father was a, a Michigan State Ag uh, person, and he was uh, influenced by the Grapes of Wrath and passed that on to Jim. If you read Jim's 
many, many, but he wrote 40 books. So there are a lot of them, but he has a character named Brown Dog who exists in a number of his novellas. And he he's a cut right out of, although it takes place in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, he's a cut right out of uh, Mac and the Boys. And it's that kind of spirit uh, about, um, fo you know, uh, folkways and uh, common experiences. People are relatively uneducated. And uh, so I, I would, even though he, he, he died, just as I say, he died six years ago and he's still contemporary to me. He's one of my favorite writers and a dear friend, but I, I would, I would have thought Jim, Jim would be right in there as a great inheritor of the Steinbeckian influence. In fact, he, he uh, contributed a chapter uh, to Susan's book on, um, uh, uh, you know, on um, centennial what, reflections. Yeah, on yeah, centennial reflections to John Steinbeck. So he'd be my first choice. You want me to go next? I guess we can go in order. Or can... <laughs> you know, I think a lot about this question and there's there's certain authors that are obvious, but you know, I've realized as I have been reading contemporary books that what I like is sort of warm hearted, compassionate books with a broad canvas. And I think Steinbeck wrote those kind of books, the Grapes of Wrath, certainly, um, East of Eden, um, even, again, Travels with Charlie. So the, I've read two books recently that seemed to me Steinbeckian in their, in their, in their kind of um, generous embrace of humanity. And one of them is Still Life by Sarah Winman, which is set in London and Florence and is about a kind of reconstructed family really. Um, and that's what Steinbeck's always writing about, families that are, are not, nuclear families, but families that are in some ways, you know, whether it's Mac and the Boys or Tortilla Flat or, you know, East of Eden or Grapes of Wrath, they're families that are reconstructed and they, they have to pull together in ways that are certainly not um, traditional. And that's kind of what that book is about. And the other book I just finished was The Lincoln Highway, which is, you know, it's about three or people on the lamb, really. <laughs> so you immediately think of Tom Joe getting out of jail. But it's also about, you know, it's about connections, about understanding, it's about, you know, survival, it's about the dream of getting to California. In fact, the book isn't about the Lincoln Highway at all. So it's kind of like Steinbeck, you know, you, you, you think you're going to be hearing about the California dream, but, you know, it's, it's not about the dream of California, it's about something else. So I, I think a lot of people, you know, who write in that tradition of, you know, expansive, warm-hearted, epic portrayals of people and place and family and America inherited Steinbeck spirit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, I also in, in that vein of the kind of warm-hearted story, the communal story, you know, from Cannery Row to the, which was the first Steinbeck book uh, that I read, to you know, so many of his other books. Um, I want to speak to a couple contemporary authors. Another author who sadly uh, just passed, but was um, uh, a very young author, Anthony Viasnaso, whose book, uh, whose short story collection, After Parties, is set in the Central Valley, um, the Cam Cambodian American community. Um, that uh, it's a wonderful book, and in fact, Anthony was a Steinbeck Fellow just uh, a year before last. Um, also, Gary Soto, whose uh, work has uh, traversed the Central Valley, especially his uh, young adult book, Buried Onions, wonderful book set in Fresno, but many of Gary's works, you know, take on the, uh, the lives, the experiences of Chicano Americans, um, you know, all over California. Also a mentor of mine, Susan Strait, um, Susan's books, uh, once again, um, and, you know, in, in over 10 novels at this point, uh, really form a, uh, a whole uh, kind of compendium of, you know, California lives. Um, also want to mention two other writers, if I may. One is uh, Walter Mosley, who reminds me of Steinbeck, uh, you know, Mosley's subject matter is nothing like Steinbeck's, although another California author. Um, you know, in, in, in the most uh, obvious ways, Mosley's work is nothing like Steinbeck's, but when I think about the kind of marginal men 
uh, the marginalized men that populate uh, Steinbeck's work uh, so thoroughly. There is a lot of, um, there's a lot of, um, what's the word? <laughs> Uh, you know, th there's a lot of similarity there with, with Steinbeck's work. And finally, Barbara Ehrenreich, who is not a novelist, uh, but who, whose book Nickel Nickeled and Dimed is certainly about, um, you know, income and wealth disparity and, um, uh, and, and, and again, all the problems that that fosters throughout a society. So. Yeah, and she does the kind of field work that Steinbeck did too, right? Like she goes, it's yeah. not just, Absolutely. yeah armchair reporting but sort of embodied in the community yeah that's great thanks for that uh list keenan and if people have questions about other or about books keenan mentioned i tried to drop a couple links in the chat but we can always uh clarify at the end too if you're looking for a read yeah i have to say um i'm teaching an environmental future seminar right now we just read uh flight Full Steinbeckian inheritor, especially with her attention to sort of blue collar Appalachian communities, you know, the integrity of the science in her books, I think. Yeah. Uh, but if you haven't read Flight Behavior, it's a great sort of climate fiction um, that's very much in that big hearted mode that Susan's talking about. Um, wonderful. Let's see. Um, just a, oh, this is a nice quick one. Yeah, please. Oh, I just, you know, Steinbeck always said the thing that made him upset always was um, the imposition of power on the powerless. Um, mm -hmm. And that dynamic of power and powerlessness is really what runs through a lot of the, you know, the things we mentioned, but I think it's also true of Steinbeck's work. Just a, totally. No, I yeah. think that's great. Well, and it reminds me of that quote to the um, knowing a man well never leads to hate and almost or nearly always leads to love. Right. Yeah. So both that sort of the relationship of power, the imposition of power, then also with that big heartedness you're talking about, Susan, the ability to kind of see, see beyond um, assumptions, right? And the work that it takes to get there. Um, well, this one's a really easy one. Uh, what do you guys wish more people knew about Steinbeck? Well, I, I guess I wish they, um... They oh, Bob, a little, a little louder if you can. I guess I wish they, <laughs> I guess I wish they knew more about the range of his uh, temperament and uh, write and writing. Experimented with a lot of different things, you know, fiction, nonfiction, full-length novels, plays, uh, uh, film scripts, uh, short essays, commercial writing. I'm, it's quite uh, quite impressive, and I also wish people knew more about the fact that he defined himself uh, from beginning to end as a as a fully committed, engaged writer, and that's what he did. You know, he didn't really have a job outside of <laughs> outside of the writing, um, but he got up every day and never took it for granted. And if you read his journals, uh, he, he left quite a few journals of the writing compositional journals and so on, you get this sense of remarkable um, attentiveness to it, it, the, inner it, the inner landscape of his consciousness. And just day after day after day after day, I see him from beginning to end, from, you know, uh, start of a novel all the way through. It's really remarkable, really. Uh, I wish more people knew that. Uh, a lot of sweat and tears and blood involved in uh, those finished finished products. You want me to go? Be I, think, great. I think he, I wish more people really um, knew about his real love of and understanding of an appreciation of science and a you're really an ecological pr perspective. Certainly we know of his friendship with Ed Ricketts and that they were friends for 18 years, et cetera. But that sense of those principles that he, um, he and Ricketts discussed, you know, survivability and, um, you know, just 
group behavior, colonial animals and what he saw in the intertidal and biology and physics and what, you know, he saw in human relations. I think, you know, he's really that blend or that intersection of science and the humanities is something that, you know, he um, is apparent in all of his works, even his last works, um, Winter for Disc last novel, Winter for Discontent. So I guess I wish more people really, his own favorite book was Sea of Cortez. So I wish more people read it, so. Yeah, I, I guess. About oh, sorry, Kina. Yeah, yeah, I did not know that either. Um, the uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would hope especially that younger people um, could learn something about the the negative reaction in the press and in corporate corporate America and even in the government. Um, some parts of the American government to the publication of the Grapes of Wrath and to its, you know, its popularity, the uh, pushback and, you know, um, it's, it goes beyond pushback. Uh, you know, the Steinbeck scholars on this call can speak to this uh, more firm in more detail than I can. But I think it's, it is particularly important that the young people not just view Steinbeck as this sort of, um, you know, frankly, is it, it just this dead guy who wrote some books back in the day that people used to care about, but as a figure who was incredibly dynamic, whose work um, was important in large, in in some part because, you know, because it was uh, because it opposed um, the main currents of the you know of, of the economy of the uh, of the prevailing uh, you know social structure and so forth uh, that had you know caused the Great Depression and, and certainly the deepened the Great Depression and caused so much suffering in America. Um, and the, you know, Steinbeck's work held, held the powers to be to account um, much to their displeasure and that, you know, he, um, you know, he, he suffered for it, you know. Um, and so I think that that is uh, something that I would want people to, to know about Steinbeck and about his work. Very good. Got a good question in the uh, comments. How did he uh, steer clear of HUAC during the 40s and 50s? Um, to Keenan's point about the ways that his works were really like, um, I mean, in many ways antagonistic to the status quo, right? Trying to push for, push for awareness and change. Uh, that was a great response. Thanks, everybody. Um, the other one, I think, just to kind of keep mixing it up is, um, do you have, let's see, yeah, I guess uh, in this vein, um, what's, for you, what is Steinbeck's most resonant work today? Either because as a follow-up to your previous answer or just kind of in general. And then if you feel like speculating, what's the work that, if we were gonna adapt this work, what would you, how would you like to see it adapted? But mostly just what's the most resonant work today? Bob, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, I mean, I, I go back and forth. I change going back and forth. Um, I think it's still the grapes of wrath for a lot of metaphoric reasons. But I right next to that would be uh, Sea of Cortez, which I think is one of the absolute great unheralded, you know, uh, environmental statements of the last century. And um, it's, and and not just the not just the log portion, but to see it as it was published in 1941 as a kind of uh, twinning of you know uh, narrative and uh, and bio and science, it was a real uh, game changer in a lot of ways, and I think very, very few people know know that. Um, so I, I would I would say it was the grapes of wrath still. Sir Cortez is right there because it's being applied to so many different things, particularly in the way we think about uh, the environment now as uh, you know uh, species related and so on. And the third one for me uh, would be uh, Cannery Row, which I think is just one of Steinberg's absolute marvelous 
production. So I, I just think it's a, I love that book. And um, what he did there, I think is uh, just truly remarkable. I have a whole chapter in this new book that's coming out where I, I talk about the ways in which uh, it wasn't just the experience of Monterey that influenced that book, but that Steinbeck had been reading heavily in, in quantum physics and <clears throat> a number of different sciences and psychology and so on that all of it, it got into that book and not only uh, underscored the way characters were created, but also really helped uh, uh, establish the, uh, the formal elements of it. Uh, you know, um, quick cut chapters and uh, the ra random, random events that uh, don't necessarily uh, follow a cause and effect kind of relationship. I mean, it's just a really remarkable early postmodern novel. I think and very few people see it in that, in that way. So those, are, those would be my three that I'd, I'd uh, uh, like to see done. I don't know what I want in the way of a, a, a film version. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I don't know. Maybe in dubious battle. That's at some point a really good version of it. <laughs> dare to dream, right? Yeah, dare to dream, right? <laughs> Who wants to jump in next? Well, I yeah, I guess if I'm going. Up here. I you know I just watched we're watching Sydney Poitier movies and to watch the Defiant ones on Saturday night, and I thought, oh. Lenny and George, you know, <laughs> two guys chained together that can't, you know, and they're always kind of plunging into the water and um, have to kind of just, you know, that, that tension and they're, they're running. Um, so there's so much of Steinbeck and just, you know, running away from, you know, a society that they can't function in and trying to find freedom or something else, something better. So I guess of Mice and Men, it, it, you know, it's a book that I keep coming back to because I see it so often, or maybe I just, you know, see it too often. I'm seeing Steinbeck everywhere. But um, I think it, it's full of little scenes that are kind of like microaggressions that we're confronting today of, um, of, Curly's wife and what she represents and how she she threatens those men, but is lonely when she's at in Crook's room and how she threatens him. It's like little studies in power and powerlessness again and again in the book. And it's just, you know, it's a book that's he, um, you know, he said it was a little study in 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 humility, but it's just a book that just keep, I keep coming back to that. Um, it's a book most people have read. They read it in high school, but I've never had, say, a class not reread it and see something new in it. So the fact that it's being banned today, I think, is is too bad because it's being banned for the wrong reasons. So to me, anyway, that's so. Um, I don't know if I want to see another film of it, but I think there are good films of it. <laughs> but I think the book is still rewarding. Yeah, to follow up on that, um, I remember, I, I don't know where she said this, but uh, Toni Morrison at some, some point in her long and illustrious career said that when Song of Solomon was banned in the prisons in um, I think Pennsylvania, that it was one of the great honors of her life. Um, generally, the people who ban books, you know, are uh, people whom, you know, it is good to oppose. And so, I think that the fact that Steinbeck's books have 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 come under censure, you know, at various times uh, throughout, you know, through the last uh, 70, 80 years of American history, right, um, says something about the, you know, about the real, you know, the real challenge that that Steinbeck's uh, work has, uh, you know, has made to the, you know, to the American status quo, the corporate status quo, and so forth. Um, you know, uh, Bob and Susan have mentioned, uh, you know, pretty much all the books that I uh, would um, would name here. But I, I would think that Travels with Charlie, which, you know, Susan mentioned earlier, uh, would make for, uh, you know, an excellent uh, adaptation or recasting in the current, uh, in current times. 
uh, perhaps, you know, with, uh, I, I could picture any number of intellectuals, uh, you know, kind of taking the same, you know, trip across America and uh, reporting on, report, reporting and musing, and contemplating on, uh, on our current, our current situation. So. I think those are wonderful answers. Um, we've got a question in the uh, chat. No advocates for East of Eden. I have to say, I feel like that's probably the one that would make a great like HBO film or HBO series. You know, one of these, you know, like the Gilded Age, one of these sort of high budget, like slow build multi-character. But someone also said um, Pastures of Heaven. And I feel like you could probably do that in the Long Valley and with the short stories in general, just kind of make a really interesting, beautiful sort of Salinas piece. Yeah. Though I'd also love to see a graphic novel of Sea of Cortez. If you could get a science illustrator on the species or on the, you know, like you could do some really, that might be a way to bring that into classrooms in a broader way, really beautifully. But, so if anyone's out there, anyone knows a science illustrator, you know, please get them on board with them. Um, cool. Uh, let's shake it up a little bit more. We've got a a little bit more time to we'll, we'll open up for audience questions in about 13 minutes. So if you've got a question or one that comes up, feel free to drop it in the chat now or later. Um, let's see. Oh, now we're on to some of the individual questions. Um, I'm curious, uh, Bob, I know that you, I, a little bird told me that you read the werewolf novel. What do you think of it? For those of you who aren't aware, there's the lost sort of Steinbeck werewolf novel, Murder at a uh, full moon that was never published, but. I found it interesting. Um, it's, it, you know, uh, it depends on how you feel about transparency. I mean, I think we probably all would like to be able to have a, a you know, that available to us. It's not very good. Steinbeck poo pooed it himself, you know. But I, when I was do when I was working on uh, Steinbeck's reading years ago, that manuscript was a was a uh, goldmine to me because he mentions it's heavily indebted to Carl Jung's uh, psychology of dementia precox, and he mentions all kinds of uh, uh, mystery novel writers, uh, Van Dyne, and a bunch of others. And I thought this was kind of a goldmine for uh, my book Steinbeck's reading because Steinbeck had obviously read all that stuff in order to write this book, which he wrote in nine days, you know? So, so he was cribbing like crazy, I think. But, um, but it's, a, you know, it's a fun thing. It's, it's completely uh, off the wall, I guess I wanna say. I, I don't think, he didn't take it seriously. You know, I think it's kind of comical in, in a lot of ways, but it's, it was interesting to me because here he was in 1930, already doing that kind of postmodern thing where, you would call attention to the fictionality of the thing you're writing. You know, um, that was the kind of thing that, uh, you know, Faulkner was doing and, and Virginia Woolf and, and other modernist writers. Uh, and it was never thought to be Steinbeck's bailiwick, but by God, there it was. And if you keep looking further ahead, you see it again in Cannery Row, you see it again in Sweet Thursday, um, you see it again in East of Eden where he turns up as a character in his own novel. I mean, so there were seeds of, of that uh, murder at full moon that I found really resonant and interesting. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't know he wrote it in nine days. That's wild. Yeah, he, 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 he just ripped it right off. He wanted to get it out there so he could see if um, they could uh, sell it to a commercial publisher and he could make some money. <laughs> it didn't happen, but... Um, uh, anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of uh, authors who write, and I, I don't think it was nine days, but uh, thinking of authors who write incredible books in a short amount of time, or in this case, a book. I don't know that it's incredible. Um, Murder at Full Moon, that is. But Susan, uh, I know you're teaching a Faulkner class right now. Keen and I know you've got a really uh, steady interest in Faulkner. And I was wondering if you guys could comment a little bit on what you see as sort of resonances between the two authors or, you know, in what way do they help us think about one another? Or, yeah. How do we, uh, they're often compared, right? Um, but what do you think? Well, 
I mean, the most obvious comparison, I suppose, is, you know, that complete immersion in place and trying to, um, you know, what Faulkner called his little postage stamp of soil, Yachtna Batafa County. And, you know, Steinbeck said he was going to put Central California on the map. But it was, a, it was more than just like the geography of a place. It was, it was the history, it was the people, it was the flora, it was the fauna for, you know, Steinbeck's got a great passage in Travels with Charlie where he talks about place is also, um, you know, a kind of magical confusion that takes permanent hold. I, you know, I love that phrase, magical confusion. I mean, he was trying to write sort of the, the mythic quality of the central California, just as, you know, Faulkner takes on the, the, the myths and realities of the South. So I think just being saturated with place was um, something that both of them had um, in common. And then, you know, that, aware, that awareness of social hierarchies, which obviously, you know, Faulkner is looking at the county in terms of race, in terms of, you know, the yeoman farmers and um, the aristocracy and the decayed aristocracy. So he's looking at hierarchies. And, you know, Steinbeck was always looking at hierarchies of power and powerlessness and Salinas and elsewhere. Um, and then I think, um, you know, he, they're both trying to tackle the kind of major tensions of the regions, the history, the kind of you know, the sad history of the region and, you know, and the conflicts that were involved in that, both personal and um, cultural. And so I think, you know, their, their grasp was, um, was, was wide, especially in a book like East of Eden, where Steinbeck, you know, wants to take on the history of his whole, of his whole county. And, um, you know, I, I was just thinking, I was teaching Sound and the Fury, so one of the most poignant lines in the Quentin section is, if I could say mother, which has a whole history of Mrs. Compson and her whining ways. Um, but, you know, East of Eden is about looking for a mother too, looking for somebody, something to nurture. And so, you know, there are lots of, lots of, um, lots of little parallels too. I think the two for a penny episode in Grapes of Wrath that Steinbeck took it from the little Italian girl in, um, in uh, Sound of the Fury. I don't have any evidence of that at all, but it's, it's the same dynamic there with the, with the woman in the bakery kind of becoming, you know, sort of kinder just because of the confrontation. Um, and that's really what Two for a Penny is about. So I think, you know, Steinbeck certainly was aware of Faulkner, Faulkner aware of Steinbeck too. And they did become friends of a sort later on in life. But I, you know, I think, I think they were both, um, then they were, that's all they cared about was writing. Yeah. Um, well, and to that last point uh, you made, Susan, uh, Faulkner claimed to have written as they lay dying in less than a month on the back of a wheelbarrow while he was working in a mine. He probably was a lie, right? But <laughs> but Steinbeck apparently actually wrote this book in nine days. So um, maybe it's not quite a, the quality of as they lay dying, you know, but <laughs> um, but he actually did it. So so there's that. Um, yeah, uh, beyond beyond that uh, trivia, the. I, I would second, you know, everything that Susan said uh, about the, um, you know, the focus on region, um, the 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 um, the focus on uh, the the conflicts between um, both both the you know the 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 yeoman farmer um, and kind of corporate interests. You see that in with Faulkner, especially in the Hamlet, um, you know sort of toward the end of Faulkner's major period. Um, and of course, these are, uh, the writers are contemporaneous to one another. And so, um, so you see some of the same tensions around, um, around the, you know, the obsolescence of the, you know, of these, you know, small, small farmers, these uh, tenant farmers and so forth versus, um, you know, the, the the will of the corporations and, and so forth. Um, also, uh, you know, a focus in both of them uh, it, uh, on ecological concerns. You see this in the bear with Faulkner, which is, you know, um, very much, a, you know, an um, environmentalist text, uh, 
just not primarily how it's read, but that's certainly, you know, for a long time been, um, you know, there's a lot of critical, you know, um, critical opinion that uh, is focused around that. So I would say all those, all those are uh, ways in which you see synergy between, uh, between their two catalogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. And I love that you mentioned the bear. That's one of my favorites. And I'm with you. I feel like it, there's a whole, especially with the role of the railroad coming into the force in that novel, there's a whole sort of environmental history or ecological reading you could do. Um, cool. Let's see. Uh, Bob, I wonder if you could tell us about um, sort of an early encounter with Steinbeck or a memory of encountering Steinbeck. Well, Either when you first read or first really got the bug for Steinbeck. Before any of you were alive. <laughs> so uh, I went to college in Massachusetts and I, <clears throat> I played hockey and I wasn't a very good student. Um, and I had to write a senior thesis in my senior year. I had no clue what to do. And I had a, there were a couple of young American lit professors that I'd taken a class from and they said to me, you know, hey kid, you ought to read Steinbeck, and uh, which turned out to be kind of a salvation. But at the time, I didn't realize that they were, you know, they were kind of fitting the subject to the to the writer, uh, so to speak. You know, as if to say, I don't think you could handle Faulkner or uh, <laughs> Virginia Woolf, but Steinbeck is right up your alley. So and this is a true story. I've told this story a number of times. I went on the way to hockey practice one day. I went to. I stopped at. The, I was living off campus in an apartment. And I went to the college library and I look up in the stacks and I came across the Steinbeck section. And the first book my hand fell on was uh, Travels with Charlie, which had been published just two years earlier. And I sat in the, I sat down in the stack and I started to breeze through it. And it was the first time in my life, I was an English major, get, get, you know, understand. It was the first time in my life I ever read a book that had an experience in it that I recognized because I'd lived through it. And that was uh, Hurricane Donna, which came up the East Coast and went across Sag Harbor where Steinbeck was living. I lived across Long Island Sound in Southwestern Connecticut when I grew up in, in high school and so on. And that storm, I never forget, no one ever forgot. It was the, one of the worst uh, uh, storms that, that Connecticut part of the Sound had ever seen. And it was the first time I ever, and he writes about that. And uh, it was the first time I'd ever read anything that I'd actually taken that had been part of my life. You know, so forget about Joyce's Dublin or, you know, Shakespeare's England, which I at that time never thought I would ever see. And here was something that was right in my backyard. And so I ended up, that, that hooked me, it really did. I read, read the book, it was never, it never became one of my major go-to books, you know, like the way Grapes of Wrath or East of Eden was, um, but it really hooked me. And I felt like uh, this was somebody whose language I could understand. I could understand where he was coming from and blah, 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 that kind of thing. So that was my experience. And that was 212 years ago. You know, it was a long time ago, it was 1964. That's when I started. Um, you know, and it's one of those classic cases where one thing leads to another, you know what I mean? You have one door opens and then you walk down the hallway and another door opens and you follow that and you end up, you know, like 200 years later, you know, publishing your last book on Steinbeck. So here you go. It's all related as Steinbeck says, you know, everywhere there's a, you know, it's all related, you know, it's a tight, from the tide pool of the stars, there's a, there's a tissue of connection <laughs> we're all part of, so anyway. Oh. Thanks, Bob. Um, how wild. Also, like, how interesting to start with Travels with Charlie. I mean, I think that's a great place to start, but I feel like it's not where so many of us start, or at least me, who was assigned mice and men like a few different times in California and elsewhere, you know. Um, so we, we're getting to time for questions. So again, feel free to drop those in the chat. I was wondering, I, one question for Keenan as our sort of novelist in the room. What uh, 
but Steinbeck sort of craft as a fiction writer. You know, I think we can, we all bring our different who's about sort of, I mean, the act of crafting novels. What stands out to you about Steinbeck or there passage, has there been a passage or a moment that really resonated with you on that sort of level of, of being a writer of fiction sure. or novels? Yeah, it, thank you. Yeah, I'd say two things. One, um, that uh, when I came to Winesburg, Ohio, Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio, um, and read it, um, I don't want to like throw shade on Sherwood, but uh, I realized that I had read really a different and frankly more powerful version of this idea, you know, this uh, this premise of the you know story of the community, the small community. Uh, but that was not held up by, you know, in, in the literary canon in the way that Winesburg, Ohio is, that I'd read a, a version of this when I was like 10, 12 years old, when my father gave me Cannery Row, which, as I said, was the first Steinbeck book that I read. Uh, read. Um, so, you know, it's a wonderful introduction to Steinbeck's work. Um, the third Steinbeck book I, I read, um, I think, you know, I was assigned it in school. I can't remember if this was assigned, you know, by my dad or by the school, um, <clears throat> but was, uh, you know, after of Mice and Men. It was Grapes of Wrath, of course. And um, there is a passage that I, um, uh, that I'd like to, to read specifically. Um, and in my version of the book, it's on page 238, but there's a lot of different versions of this book. The works of the roots of the vines of the trees must be destroyed to keep up the price. And this is the saddest, bitterest thing of all. Carloads of oranges dumped on the ground. The people came for miles to take the fruit, but this could not be. How would they buy oranges at 20 cents a dozen if they could drive out and pick them up? And men with hoses squirt kerosene on the oranges and they are angry at the crime angry at the people who have come to take the fruit. A million people hungry, needing the fruit, and kerosene sprayed over the golden mountains, and the smell of rot fills the country. I'm gonna skip down a paragraph. There's a crime here that goes beyond denunciation. There's a sorrow here that weeping cannot symbolize. There's a failure here that topples all our success. The fertile earth, the straight tree rows, the sturdy trunks, and the ripe fruit and children dying of pellagra must die because a prophet cannot be taken from an orange. And coroners must fill in the certificate that died of malnutrition because the food must rot, must be forced to rot. I remember reading that when I was, you know, early in my teens and just being so deeply moved, so deeply moved by Steinbeck's sense of social justice is, you know, really compelling me to understand um, power relations at their most brutal um, and most, uh, you know, most unequal and really, you know, having my sense of, you know, of social justice uh, awakened by John Steinbeck um, and will always feel indebted to Steinbeck for that. Keenan. That was great. Chapter 25 is one of the great chapters in the grapes. But the, I don't know if you knew this or not, but Steinbeck went to see uh, Sherwood Anderson read at Stanford when he was a student. And he went to, uh -huh. and that's, and I know, I know that, but I, there was never any reaction from Steinbeck about, you know, about the reading, what they thought about it and so on. So really interesting kind of, I don't know, nexus, I guess you could say, because there certainly is some of Anderson's path-breaking mentality, you know, in the in the Pastures of Heaven and some of the later work too. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, yeah, I did not know that, and uh, but it does help to kind of map a literary um, genealogy. Thank you. And Keenan, the you know the the Steinbeck fell uh, the or the Steinbeck Award in the Souls of the People is taken from the end of that chapter um, when the, the final passage, when you know the people become angry enough, they won't tolerate injustice anymore. So they mm -hmm. took that little, when we started it with Bruce Springsteen, when he 
came to campus. Um, that was the quote that that identified that award. Same chapter. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a powerful one. Um, and the most incendiary in the book. You know, it's the one that made him made people want to ban the book and say, hey, he he's advocating, you know, violence and um, unions and uh, mm. overthrowing the status quo. So mm. we got to investigate this guy. That's why he didn't get a commission during World War II. That's why he was labeled a communist. You know, it's that chapter, that's the heart of it, you know. So. I appreciate the context for myself and for everybody on the call. Yeah. Yeah, and that was a beautiful reading. Thanks, Kimi. Um, well, we're at 521. Um, and for those of you uh, who are keeping time, we're coming up to an hour, but we've got permission to go a bit over. So why don't we turn it to audience questions? Um, and then for the panelists, if you have any questions for each other too, we can, uh, of course, fold those in. For those of you in the audience, if you want to jot a question down, you can drop it in the chat and I'll facilitate it for you or uh, you can use the little reactions. It's the smiley face with the plus on it. Use the raise hand fe feature and that'll help bring you to our attention right away. If you wanna verbally participate and share your question or even just share an appreciation for our wonderful guests. Let's see, the first one I'm seeing is, um, oh, thank you. I've got one from Doug. Um, would love to hear more about how JS avoided HUAC. That's maybe more for Susan or Bob. Well, you have any he was investigated by, um, you know, by the uh, um, FBI, but and his neighbors were questioned, and they said, "What is him? What is his mail like? And does he get, you know, is he does he have communist affiliations?" He had he had gone to meetings of the John Reed Club in Carmel in the 30s. So, you know, he was attracted to communist organizations. His wife, Carol, actually joined the Communist Party in 1936. So that also, you know, raised hackles. Uh, but he was never a communist. I mean, he was attracted to communist ideology, but I interviewed somebody once who was an organizer in the 30s, a woman named Carolyn Decker. And she said, you had to be a hunk of protoplasm not to be attracted to the Communist Party in the 1930s, which I thought was a great line. I mean, you know, seemed like like 1929, capitalism had collapsed. So why wouldn't you be attracted to socialism and et cetera? So, um, but to answer your question, they investigated him. They didn't see much evidence that he was actually, uh, you know, certified card-carrying communist. So they denied him a commission in World War II, but by the time the 50s came around, he didn't, you know, he seemed a safe author and so he wasn't investigated further. Bob might have something to add to that. Yeah, but. no, that's, that's actually the truth too. Um, and then he entered the fray uh, when he defended um, Arthur Miller um, publicly. He was one of the few people who stood up to McCarthy in that regard. But um, yeah, no, he was a, you know, he was a, a New Deal Democrat. I, I talked uh, quite a few times to Per Lorenz, who was FDR's, uh, you know, documentary filmmaker, made that famous movie, The Plow That Broke the Plains and the, and the River, both of them. And he, he said that a number of times, that, you know, Simic was not a communist. He was interested in certain socially inspired ideas, but generally speaking, he was in the New Deal Democrat fold under uh, of Roosevelt, so um, so it looks pretty mild. <laughs> not not to, for what we have now, believe me. So anyway, but um, you know, I think he was a guy who, who whose heart was in the right place most of the time. You know, and I, I think that that propelled a, a good deal of his stances toward, you know, lack of justice and and so on. So. And I always loved him because uh, my father was a, my father was a, you know, working class guy who belonged to a union. And I can remember how, how important the goddamn union was to my father and to my uncles. Um, you know, Steinbeck, uh, Steinbeck seemed to have his, his hand and his finger on those, on those things. Why, 
certain collective actions ought to be allowed. They, they're, they're valuable. They give people a voice. They give them a sense of power. They give them a sense of, you know, entitled, not, entitlement is not quite the right word. Agency, I guess, is what I want to say, you know, but, um, and I think he always, I think he always had his, his heart was in the right place on those, on those issues, I think in many, many, many ways. So, uh, blah, another, blah. another footnote on that, Pierre Lorenz's papers went to the Pierpont Morgan, as Bob knows, but they were given in seemingly two parts. And the second part of it, which I encountered when I was there, are all about a series of letters between Steinbeck and Pierre Lorenz about publishing the same chapter, a version of the same chapter that Keenan read, an earlier version called Starvation Under the Orange Trees. Steinbeck wanted it published in the people's world. And so he kept trying to get it published around the country in the people's world. Now, and well, in, that was in San Francisco, but he wanted it in, in communist publications. So, um, and Pierre Lorenz was kind of helping him with that. Um, I think a lot of people though later covered their tracks about their kind of associations with the Communist Party. I know that Francis Whitaker, who was the instigator of the Communist Party really in Carmel, wrote an autobiography and never mentions it. Um, and I think Pierre Lawrence did too, to some extent. So anyway, an untold history. Yeah. There's still a lot of untold history where Steinbeck is concerned. There's so much archival material that has never been, you know, uh, exposed or, you know, open to the public eye. That there's just all kinds of, as Susan well knows, there's all kinds of, you know, byways and secret passages and attics and cellars and so on in the, you know, in the Steinbeckian habitation that uh, um, I, I wish would come forward. I wish we, we had a great, a, a great edition of Steinbeck's letters, which we don't have. Many of the letters that came out in the Viking Press edition in 1975 are, are edited. Some of them are truncated heavily. If you go look at the originals, and uh, um, you know, you realize what was a lot of the stuff was left out. Um, so we need a really, really good uh, annotated, historically based collection of his. He was a great letter writer. He was funny. He was uh, Susan. I'm sure will back this up. He was. Uh, smart, intelligent, uh, perceptive, uh, funny, great sense of humor, and he wrote a lot, day after day after day. And the a volume of his letters, a real volume of his letters, would be quite an addition to the Steinbeck canon, believe me. He was a much better writer, letter writer, I think, than Faulkner. Um, uh, and he really deserves to be better known in that, in that regard. So, anyway. So somebody out there, get working on it. <laughs> It'll probably take you 10 years, but too late for me. But <laughs> If I may jump in real quick and just add on to something Bob said a little earlier about unions and particularly speaking to the relevance of Steinbeck in the current day, um, you know, there's so many fewer American workers who um, are, you know, who have the, um, you know, who, who, uh, have the option of joining a union now, as opposed to, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, you know, I really think that indubious battle should be taught in high schools. I think that, um, you know, that American school children should, um, you know, uh, indubious battle or another book by another author, you know, um, Chester Himes, Lonely Crusade, there are, you know, other such books as well um, <clears throat> about unionizing. Um, it is, these are, uh, the union is a critical uh, tool, right, within a capitalist structure for workers to advocate for our rights. Um, you know, when you think about like the great resignation of recent months, um, this has largely been driven by Americans realizing in the wake of the pandemic that, um, you know, the working conditions were intolerable, that their work, that their personal, you know, job, uh, requirements and you know compensation was not uh wasn't tolerable it wasn't sustainable um and they needed to figure some other way of uh you know of getting you know of, of getting fair treatment and and so forth and so you know i again um steinbeck should be very much alive to us you know and read 
as you know relevant in the contemporary in contemporary times because of that um yeah i have to i mean if you don't mind me sort of pivoting and pivoting off that keenan i have to totally agree uh, i've got a chapter in my book on um dolores Huerta's um oh heroes and saints right and i look at um its representation of um, sort of pesticides in the field. But anyway, it brought me into a deep dive on pesticide law in California and how the role that county agricultural commissioners play in regulation. There's like virtually no kind of regulation that's enacted top down. It's all bottom up from people in position, like county positions. And I may make some enemies here. But then recent, more recently, I was reading in Dubious Battle and the way that he crafts the role of county agricultural commissioners in that novel is, was so prescient and is still so relevant to say the way that pesticides are regulated today, how they filter into farm worker communities. I mean, from there, it's like looping in the UFW. You've got this whole picture that I think, I'm with you, I think both in the importance of unions and in the way something like Indubious Battle, I know it gets critiqued a lot for its ending or for what some people feel is like that it's a critique of unionizing in some way. But I think the ways that he illustrates arrangements of power and people struggling within these sorts of inflexible systems, I think that's timeless, you know, and I think it's more relevant than it's ever been. So yeah, I just totally agree. Um, I recommend John Sayles' Mate One too, if you haven't seen it. It's a great, great film. He won the Steinbeck Award as well, so once. John Sales won the Steinbeck Award and it was sold out. And my dean, it wasn't a, at the time, it wasn't a moviegoer. I said, wow, what if we get more people? And he said, don't worry about it. You can go in the engineering building. That day, about another 75 people showed up. And I went up to John Sales and I said, what do we do? And he said, he looked at me, he said, let him in. They were in the aisles, they were on the stage. John Sales stepped through people to get to the podium, not minding at all. It was just such a great moment of, you know, community and really representing what that award meant. So. It's a beautiful memory. Yeah. Um, um, and I, I agree about the importance of Moon is Down. So the, in the chat, when everybody says how important that is, especially considering what Russia, it's happening in Russia, the idea of being in an occupied territory and what that's like and how to preserve democracy when there is a threat from without. It's a very powerful and Steinbeck imagined what it was like. He hadn't lived in an occupied town, but he imagined what it was like to be overpowered by Nazis in that case. But so when to think about like something that I wish more people knew for Moon is Down. I wish more people knew that that was mimeographed throughout Europe, right? That it was passed around among the resistance. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about a novel or in this case a play, but a piece of work that has real world effects, these are resistance fighters who are taking the time to reproduce this book, to translate it into multiple different languages and to pass it around for inspiration, for insight during wartime. I mean, I think that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Enid, there, was a, there was a question earlier about why your father told you to read books rather than magazines. I thought that was a funny one. <laughs> yeah, I will say two things. Uh, one, um, uh, the book I have coming out uh, in November, Shy Boy, Native Sons um, in Chicago Reckonings is primarily about my father, um, who had a very um, interesting life, some of which took place in Central California, um, has to do with the uprisings at Fresno State in 1969, 1970. Um, the, uh, um, why, you know, um, I, maybe that's part of why I'm an English professor. I, you know, um, I, I can't say why he gave me the books, but, um, you'd have to ask him. Um, but the, um, <clears throat> I think that the impact of, you know, of him giving me those books, uh, Steinbeck's work, uh, James Baldwin, Richard Wright, etc. cetera, these, uh, these writers, um, you know, it's profound, you know, for me. And so. 
I've got a question kind of pivoting off that for Susan and Bob. I've been wondering this for a long time. Is there, do you know if Steinbeck and Baldwin ever met or ever corresponded? Steinbeck and Ellison did, but I don't know about Baldwin. Uh, there's a photo, I just saw a photograph last year of uh, Steinbeck and Ellison, uh, some, I, I can't remember where, somewhere in upstate New York or at a, at a literary conference or a, a, an arts, uh, an arts um, uh, place or something, I can't remember, but, uh, but I don't know that he ever met Baldwin. I've never, never come across that. Maybe Susan has, but I haven't. Or Keenan, sorry. I haven't, I haven't come across any direct reference, but he doesn't talk to, about too many authors that he met unless they were good friends. So it's hard to say he, he didn't, he didn't talk about. Yeah, no, I haven't, I, 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 I'm, I'm not aware of that either, but, uh, you know, I know Richard uh, Wright was also in the John Reed club in Chicago. Um, I think part of it is just a, you know, regional thing, um, you know, Steinbeck being way off in California. Um, so, yeah, right. I wonder if they, they probably would have gotten along better than Baldwin and Faulkner. Um, yeah, <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> It'd be hard not to. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, we had a question earlier um, from John Sanders, who's been very patient, um, or, or maybe gave up, but John, I got your question. Um, and it resonates with some other ones we've heard from folks. Um, and John's question was, the panelists recognized Steinbeck for his ability to craft works at the intersection of compassion and humanity with scientific principles. His co collaboration with Ed Ricketts with stories, did others play highly influential roles in his life as a writer? So we've talked a little bit about, I mean, Elson came up. There's a question about Joseph Campbell, maybe about the torrid <laughs> triangle between uh, among Campbell, um, Steinbeck and Carol, right? But what do you all think of other writers that Steinbeck was either connected to or that we can think about him alongside? Uh, my first one, one that leaps to, me, to mind is Jeffers, Robertson Jeffers, um, uh, Steinbeck. Uh, when I wrote, I wrote the foreword to uh, the Penguin to a God Unknown. And in my research, I came across a letter, an unpublished letter by Steinbeck in which he, in which he uh, is somewhat um, cheeky about, uh, about Jeffers coming into what Steinbeck called his country and writing about it when he was, you know, grew up in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so he kind of held that against him. But Jeffers would be one. I think that there's a, I can't remember now everything I said in that introduction, but I think if you go back and look at To God Unknown or look at my introduction, there's a good deal in there, not only about the influence of Jeffers' worldview, but also I think that Steinbeck um, crafted some of the passages into God Unknown. If you, I, I took them, I, I sort of put, put them, made, lineated them. I took them out, made it, lineated them like a Jeffers poem, and they sound very similar. They have the same kind of temper temperament and rhythm and, t and timber and so on. So Re Jeffers would be the one that the sort of top notch on, on that regard. And the other one, in great influential one, one, I think was um, uh, Mo Mo Moby Dick on uh, East of Eden. I've written quite a bit about that one. Um, Steinbeck was in Nantucket summer of 51 when the, when the Melville Centennial was taking place right there. Um, whether he went to any of the the uh, conference, uh, you know, panels and stuff like that, I don't know. But but there are some definite relationships between, you know, uh, Moby Dick, and which was really coming into its own at that point, post World War II, and uh, and East of Eden. Um, so I guess you could say I don't know, maybe Kathy owes something to Ahab. I, I don't know, <laughs> but um, you know certain monstrosity. Uh, White whale. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we've got about five minutes left uh, and I wanna be respectful of the library's closing time and all that. But I have one last question for the group maybe to send us all off with, which is for each of the members, um, what Steinbeck book or essay or short story do you want the audience to walk away and read? 
kind of coming back to our theme of Steinbeck in the 21st century, or yeah, or Steinbeck in 2022, enduring relevance. If there's a work that you want to recommend, uh, sort of end of wait, wait, don't tell me style for our audience to walk out today and either pick off their shelf or go ahead and order on their favorite independent bookstore or website. You know, if you're a writer and you're committed to your craft, I would say Journal of a Novel is really a wonderful place because, um, you know, you see there uh, all, the, all the interior workings of a, a completely addicted writer. I mean, Simic was addicted to, to writing. There's no question about it. He was addicted to language, and he said he was the happy. He was only happy when he was writing, you know. Or he no, let me put it another way. He was happiest when he was writing. Um, but that's a that was an eye-opening book to me when it came out in 1969. I, I in a lot of ways, a lot of what I wrote about Steinbeck early on was really influenced by the publication of Journal of a Novel. I just saw there was a side to him there that I'd never seen. And I don't think many people who knew Steinbeck had had seen either. So that would be mine. I'd go for that one. Isn't that what you think? I guess I'd have to say, you know, dip into Log from Sea of Cortez or read it. But um, start with the essay at the end about Ed Ricketts. Um, it should be at the beginning. It used to be at the beginning. And I think, you know, what I like about that book is, um, it's conversational. It's based on conversations that he had with Ricketts throughout the 1930s. And so um, the art of conversation is woven into every page. It's a kind of back and forth. And um, that for that reason, you can't read it in large chunks. You have to read it, you know, chapter or two at a time. Um, but it's some of Steinbeck's best prose. It's a lot of his ideas. Um, it rewards rereading because it's, it's so rich and multi-layered. Um, so I guess I would urge, plus, you know, then you can go down to Baja when you can travel again and, you know, sort of <laughs> appreciate, you know, that, that sense. And it's really, you know, Steinbeck was very much interested in Mexico and um, over a third of his books had, you know, were set in Mexico, Mexican characters in it. Um, I, I just think it's an interesting book in many, many ways. So I guess that would be the book I would. And I, just to add to what we were talking about earlier about the uh, um, black authors that Steinbeck may have encountered, Langston Hughes was in Carmel for a while um, when Steinbeck was there, although Steinbeck didn't much like Carmel. Um, but he wrote a play with Ella Winter, who was Lincoln Steffen's wife and a communist. And so whether or not they had any interaction at all, it's not clear, but they were in the same kind of circle with Lincoln Steffens. That's the kind of center of that circle. Um, yeah. Um, I guess I'll, um, I, I, I think first of all, um, Bob and Susan's uh, uh, suggestions are are wonderful ones. Um, I'll kind of because I I do not have the same uh, you know level of familiarity with Steinbeck's um, entire career. I'll suggest a book that again is another I think excellent introduction for you know especially for the young reader, uh, which would be Tortilla Flat. Um, much like Cannery Row, I, um, I, much like Cannery Row, I I think that it's. A good place to um, to start to read Steinbeck if you've if you've yet to, and especially for you know the young people on this call or for people who may um, want to give a book to a young person uh, to introduce them to Steinbeck. So. Wonderful. Well, thanks everyone. I noticed some people logging off, so why don't we do a quick round of applause? If you've got audio, feel free to turn it on or use the little hand clap or drop a little note in the chat, but this was a wonderful Going conversation. Away. Thank, Wait, you Thank you all. Thank you. Happy birthday, John. Yeah, happy birthday. We should have done a toast, right? Yeah. <laughs> we can do virtual toast. Oh, we got a few, yeah. Um, awesome. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm gonna start, I think our Monterey side has gone to close up the library. So I'm gonna stop recording and close up the event. But thank you again to our panelists and thank you everyone who attended. 
Um, really wonderful conversation. Trust me.